thank you so much for joining our event to learn more about the faculty papers in university archives. But first, I'd like to share a little bit about university archives in general. University Archives is one of six collecting areas in the Julian Edison Department of Special Collections at Washington University Libraries. We are housed in Olin Library and serve our collections in the Special Collections Reading Room on Level 1. Our collections are available for use to members of the Washington University community and outside researchers. However, currently because of the pandemic, only WashU affiliated people can schedule an appointment to access the collections in person, but we can help others remotely. University Archives mission is to collect, preserve, organize, and provide access to unique materials documenting Washington University's history in efforts to support research, teaching, and learning. The archives is comprised of over 300 unique collections chronicling the history of Washington University from 1853 to today. The archives is a wealth of primary sources and other historical materials that include paper documents and manuscripts, newspapers, photographic prints and negatives, books, films, videos, sound recordings, microfilm, architectural plans, artifacts, and digital assets. I collect material from several areas. We have university records and administrator records. So this includes things like the original charter of the university, chancellor records, including reports and correspondence to and from him, department records, campus photographs, and more. We have campus publications like the campus newspaper, alumni, and admission publications. And we collect material from alumni. And this can include things like course notes from them, other material from their life, campus memorabilia, like programs from events, and scrapbooks. We have student group material like student union, which is the student government, and student publications like the student life newspaper. And of course, we collect faculty papers, which I'll talk more about in just a moment. So what does the university archivist do? Well, I go out to departments and talk with faculty and ask for their material. I help pack it up. The image on the left here is a faculty member's office before I packed it. Then I also document it when I receive the material, and I work with other staff to arrange it and rehouse it in archival folders and boxes, which are stored in secured temperature and humidity controlled rooms. The image on the right is a couple of archival boxes from a collection that has been organized, described, and rehoused. Then we create an inventory for the collection, and this goes online so re researchers can see what we have available. I also create exhibits and present collection material to classes, and I help researchers both in person and remotely. And the image on the bottom is me helping a researcher. I work with a variety of researchers, including faculty who use specific material for classes and research, students for their individual projects, genealogists looking for information on their family members, historians writing articles or books, reunion staff looking for pictures for social media, invitations, and material for their programs, public affairs staff writing stories for the publications and for online, and more. So now let's turn to faculty papers. Have you ever wondered what faculty do with their papers when they retire? Well, I would like to share with you about those papers that come to our university archives. We have over 85 collections of faculty papers. However, we don't have all faculty, faculty member collections. We usually get them if a professor has had a long career here or done some founding research here. It's on a case by case basis. We have collections from various time periods and covering many subjects. We do not have medical faculty papers. The archives at the Beckler Medical Library care for those collections. So how do we get the faculty papers? Well, sometimes I talk with faculty as they're preparing to retire and we work together to pack the collection. Other times I'm contacted by university staff or family members after a professor has passed away. And I've packed material in university offices and at professors' homes. Sometimes I get the entire collection all at once but other times I get the collection material at several different times. And the collections can really range in size from say three boxes to over a hundred boxes. It really varies. So what do you find in faculty papers? Again, it varies, but they can include some or all of the following. Teaching material like lecture notes, syllabi, examples of exams and assignments, 
research material like research notes, copies of articles or books they used in their research, professional material including conference notes, lectures, correspondence, committee material, or personal material such as correspondence, family information, their college course material, photographs, and more. And we take both physical material and digital material. This is all important material that helps us learn more about the specific faculty person. They also are important because they document how and what was being taught at the university at a specific time in history. And their research files can help researchers on a particular topic. Sure, you can search or look into a database and find your own information on a particular topic, but if somebody's already collected some of that material, it kind of gives you a head start, so researchers find that useful as well. I won't be able to talk about all of the fact all of the faculty collections today, but I do want to highlight some of them for you. I'll provide a little information on the faculty member, what their collection includes, uses of the material, and how we got the collection. So I'm going to start with collections that we recently received. The Jack A. Kirkland Papers. Professor Kirkland helped co-found and chair the Black Studies program in 1969 and 1970s. Also, he has been a professor of social work for over 50 years. He teaches about social and economic development and more, and he's been very active in civil rights. The collection documents the early Black Studies program and various aspects of his career, and we anticipate researchers being interested in his overall career and his involvement in the Black Studies program. After Professor Kirkland and I met to discuss what material would be appropriate to come to the archives, he and a graduate student packed some material in his office, which is 11 linear feet worth and he plans to give more over time. The picture on the right are the boxes we recently received. Joseph D. Murphy Papers. Professor Murphy taught architecture at Wash U starting in 1935 and also served as Dean of Architecture. He was also a prominent architect in St. Louis. His projects include the Muni, the Climatron, and he was involved in building the Arch. He also designed Olin Library here at Wash U. His collection includes teaching material, biographical information, and material from some of his ar architectural projects. We anticipate researchers, including our own School of Architecture faculty and students, being interested in his teaching material and his architectural projects. We do have a few other St. Louis architects collections within special collections, so this is a nice addition to that material too. His grandson had the material and packed it and shipped it up from Tennessee. As you can see at the picture on the right, it's around 30 linear feet. Garland E. Allen Papers. Professor Allen is Professor Emeritus in Biology. His interest includes history and philosophy of biology, particularly genetics, embryology, and evolution. His collection includes his teaching mater material, other lectures, and lots of research files, including topics of evolution, diversity, genetics, population growth, racism, sociobiology, and more. We think researchers will be interested to see how his teaching changed or stayed the same over time and to see his extensive research material. And over the last few years, I have met with him a few times in his office, which we see in the image on the right, to pack his material. And last summer, Aaron Garrity in biology helped him pack the additional 60 boxes. Joseph Schreibman Papers. Professor Schreibman is professor of Spanish. His field of interest includes 19th and 20th century Spanish literature, Inquisition in Spain, Latin America, Portugal, and Brazil. The collection includes teaching material, lectures, and research material. We hope to find a graduate student fluent in Spanish to help organize and describe the collection, which will be a good experience for the student and also helpful to us. We expect researchers to be interested in his teaching and research material. And I've been accepting material from Professor Schreibman for several years, and he continues to donate material. We have 84 linear feet of papers and 34 shelves of books. Henry W. Berger. Professor Berger taught classes in American history and foreign policy here beginning in 1970 and had a long career here. His collection includes teaching material, especially for the class History of U.S. Foreign Relations since 1945, which looks at U.S. involvement in several wars, segregation, civil rights, and more, and also material from the Vietnam course. 
It also includes his research from his dissertation relating to foreign policy in Latin America and other subject files. And we expect researchers to be interested in the teaching material and the various subject files from his research. And I worked with his wife, Mary, who packed the collection. And I just picked up the five linear feet from her a few weeks ago. Constantine Michaelides. Professor Michaelides is Professor Emeritus in Architecture. He taught from 1960 to 1993 and also served as Dean of Architecture for many years. His collection includes his teaching and research material. It also includes architectural drawings from some of his projects, which include Washu Buildings, Bryan Hall, Macmillan Hall, Jolly Hall, and Lapata Hall. We also have his material from when he attended college in Greece, including his notes and drawings. And we expect researchers to be interested in his teaching material over his long career, as well as his architectural projects. And I met with him several times to pack the material at his house and bring them to the archives. The picture on the right is part of the collection from his house. We have 60 linear feet of material. I also did two oral history interviews with him about his time at WashU and his early life in Greece. Sarah Elgin Papers. Professor Elgin's interests include genetics and science education. She has taught biology for over 40 years. Her collection includes teaching and research material, grant material, and information from her involvement in what is now the Institute for School Partnership here at WashU. The information from that institute provides information from its beginning of the project and her role as a faculty member. And her teaching material will show how biology was taught and changed over the years, which will be useful to researchers studying, studying the history of WashU and the history of science. She and an undergraduate student packed her office, and I also helped pack material there and at her house. We have 46 linear feet of material. Now I'd like to share about some collections that we've had longer, and they've been organized and described and are available to researchers. Stephen C. Haw's papers. He taught in the history department from 2003 to 2011. His collection consists primarily of teaching material and research materials covering topics such as European economic and social history, modern France, nationalism, diplomatic history, Protestantism, and women's rights. It also includes typescripts and other materials related to some of his publications, like you can see here. Researchers could be interested in his very organized teaching material if they're studying how history has been taught over the years, as well as, as his material in writing the books and his subject files. He organized and packed his materials and donated them to us. It is around 11 linear feet. <clears throat> Emmett and Ruth Layton papers. Emmett taught courses on city planning and landscape architecture at the university from 1948 to 1959. He and his wife, Ruth, had their own architectural firm in St. Louis. They were involved in the development of the master plan of the Winston Churchill Memorial at Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, pictured here. The collection includes Emmett's teaching materials and subject files, and their joint projects, including plans, drawings, and notes. The collection shows how city planning and landscape architecture was taught, and their projects will be of interest to architecture researchers, too. Their son packed the collection and sent it to the archives from out of town, and it's around 10 linear feet. Jane Levenger Papers. Professor Levenger taught psychology here in the late 1940s through 1988. Her collection includes grant material, teaching material, research material and data, biographical material, biographical material and correspondence. Her teaching material includes psychology of personality classes, ego development classes, and psychology statistics classes. A researcher has been interested in her research material and data on ego development and her sentence completion test workshops and trainings. I worked with her son and former student to pack the materials. Some came from her home office pictured here, and we have 15 linear feet of material. Mary C. Hester Papers. Professor Hester taught social work at WashU from 1945 through the 1960s. Her collections include teaching material, research material, and professional material that includes faculty committee information. Her courses include social structure and forces, beginnings and development of social work and social class, human growth and behavior, casework, and field instruction. This collection is useful for researchers because of the committee information on field instruction and faculty advisors and various teaching material, especially from a woman faculty member. The images of some of her handwritten and typed documents from her teaching material. 
Her relative gave us the three linear feed of papers. Kevin Herbert papers. Classics professor Herbert taught about Greek and Roman art, numismatics, Greek myth, and more at WashU from 1962 to 1992. And he taught through University College until 2008. His collection includes correspondence, teaching material, research, slides by topic, and travel material. We anticipated that his slide collection could be of use for researchers, so we scanned some of them and created an online exhibit by topic for a few of the slides, like you see here. His daughter packed the collection and gave it to us. It's around 28 linear feet. Jules Henry papers. Professor Henry was professor of anthropology and sociology at WashU from 1947 to 1969, specializing in social anthropology and linguistics. His collection includes teaching material, research material, and his field notes on specific groups of people in South America, which we see here. His field notes from his anthropology observations document the language, culture, and customs of specific groups of people in Brazil. As time goes on, fewer and fewer people speak the language or know the customs. So we worked with the Unicamp State University in Brazil to digitize this material and make it available there. And we have a research guide that documents the project, so we'll share that link in the chat. The collection was donated by his wife and daughter and is 21 linear feet. The William G.B. Carson Papers. Carson was first a student at WashU, graduating in 1916, and then later taught the widely acclaimed drama course known as English 16 for 28 years. Many plays written by students in the class, like this one pictured here, were performed by Thursis, a student-run theatrical group that was overseen by Carson. And Carson tutored students who later became famous writers or actors, actresses, including Tennessee Williams, David Merrick, Marvin Miller, and Mary Wicks. This collection is comprised of musical scores with annotations by Carson, a brief history of Thursus in English 16, and a photocopy of a scrapbook compiled by Carson. I was able to use this material with graduate classes in both drama and English to show them how the plays were written back then and the importance of archives. And we combined the material with alum material from famous actress Mary Wicks and items from the manuscript collection to show graduate students the different types of material collected by archives and how they can complement each other. And this collection was donated by Carson's wife and it's half a linear foot. Arthur Holly Compton Personal Papers. Professor Compton taught WashU in, at WashU in physics from 1920 to 23 and 1954 to 61, and he also served as chancellor from 1945 to 53. His collection includes personal correspondence, lectures and research notes, which we see here, diaries and journals, biographical information, and memorabilia, and we have a separate collection of his records during his time as chancellor. In January 2010, a researcher traveled from Brazil to use the Compton Personal Papers. She was a recipient of a special collections travel grant. Her research on Compton's work with the X-ray and his travels were for her PhD in teaching, philosophy, and history of science. Other researchers have been interested in his research material and organizations he belonged to. There was recently a researcher interested in one of his colleagues who went on one of his expeditions and tragically this man died, but we found a letter from Compton talking about this man and were able to digitize it and share it with his family. Compton willed his collection to, to us and it is 126 linear feet. I also wanted to share that some of our other archive collections have information on faculty members. These include public affairs biographical files, images from the photographic services collection, campus publications like the record and the Washington magazine, student publications, and even course catalogs. And there are other faculty papers within other collecting areas and special collections. For example, the manuscripts collections include some faculty papers too. These faculty are usually literary writers, and we have a link to those collections that we can put in the chat also. And we have a lot of faculty papers um, organized with their inventories online, like you'll see here. And we have a web page that links to the inventories of the faculty papers here in University Archives, and we can share a link in the chat for that also. However, not all of the ones mentioned today are fully processed or organized and available. 
but as we organize and describe them, their inventories will go online. For those of you out there who have donated your own papers or your family members' papers, I want to express my sincere thanks. They are a wealth of material for a variety of researchers. And also to those who have provided financial support that have helped with arranging and describing the collections, digitizing the material, and or helping make them accessible. Thank you. I continue to add more faculty papers to our collection each year. So if you have your own faculty papers or know of someone whose papers could come to the archives, please contact me. And if you're interested in accessing any of the, these collections, also please out, reach out. Thank you. And now we have some time for questions. Thank you, Sonia. We have received a few questions in the chat, so we'll start with those. Um, the first one was, what materials have you worked with that are particularly difficult or technical to preserve? Mm, that's a very good question. So sometimes the papers are older or very fragile and they might have some tears in them or um, have folds in them and they don't lay flat. So they're a bit challenging to work with, but fortunately we have a preservation department and they're able to help us you know, preserve those papers and make them more stable. And sometimes rolled photographs are difficult too, but the preservation department helps us. And now that we're getting digital files, um, that's kind of a whole new world. We can, you know, describe them in similar ways, but just maintaining them. And we also are fortunate to have staff that are helping us with those digital files too. Great. And another question for faculty who have worked at multiple universities. How are their papers allocated up to them or by agreement with other institutions or how does that work? It really varies. It's usually up to the faculty member. So what we'd like to try to do is to keep that material um, together. So often it'll just go to one institution instead of separating their material from like two or three different places and distributing it that way. That makes it easier for the researchers to be able to just go to one place to locate that material. And how extensively are the Kevin Herbert papers cataloged? So most of our collections, we sometimes arrange them in series. So it'd be like correspondence versus the teaching material versus research materials. And then it'll go down to the box and folder level. Very rarely do we get down to the item level. Okay. Um, yeah. And if anybody also wants to just ask Sonia, Sonia the questions, you can do that as well. Um, if you raise your hand, I will be able to call on you or you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask. Hi all, especially Sonia. Good to see you again. I see you. Uh, I was struck in your earlier comments by a category I hadn't thought of donating, but um, I had thought of donating elsewhere for other reasons. And that was the category that you called professional material. Mm -hmm. For example, I have a good deal of material, or used to, God only knows in the chaos today, <laughs> uh, from my re research on women's rights in France. Mm -hmm. I copied in French archives, in private collections, a lot of material. And some of it I have been asked for a couple of times. And I never, it never occurred to me that that would be a natural companion to what I'd already given you. Uh, uh, an example, you showed the cover of the biography I did of Hubertino Claire. Somewhere I have a copy uh, of her personal diary. Oh, wow. Which has disappeared in the library that held it in Paris. So it is relatively scarce, although I've circulated copies to other scholars. Would you be interested in my trying to put together some of the supporting and uh, available material? Because if somebody actually were ever to look at my papers, which sounds <laughs> highly unlikely compared to famous architects and what have you, um, 
I could certainly put together a lot of materials. I blush to tell you I have pitched some already, <laughs> but uh, I can certainly do that if you're interested. Sure, I would be interested and we could t talk offline a little more um, too, but we have had some faculty that have done the research elsewhere and it's hard to get your hands on that material mm -hmm. and we've taken it into the collections to be able to make it available for people but what we have to let the researchers know is they can access the material here but then they would need to contact that originating archive if they wanted to use the material beyond fair use gotcha. which they are more than willing to do so we mm -hmm. could we could possibly add that to the collection yeah that's a good question and we can we can talk about that then That'd be I, great. I have a number of other comments, but I suspect I should let someone else talk. Well, that's fine. I was actually going to ask you if, like, <clears throat> what made you decide to give your material to us and how was the process uh, transferring that material to the university archives? Well, I spent my entire career working in archives. <laughs> <laughs> that was the nature of writing books, uh, was to spend mercifully in my case in Paris and provincial France, uh, your life working in archives and reading papers of people. And so the idea of a collection of papers was the most natural thing on earth. It just hadn't really sunk in on me that mine would be of interest to the university. And naturally I'm flattered as can be that it is. Uh, how it worked was very easy. You're, you're excellent at your job. You were encouraging, you were supportive, and uh, it became very easy to do, except for the, the hard chore of, well, you can see bookshelves behind me. Uh, I live in that kind of world, except the part you're not seeing, all the white banker's boxes full of things that... Uh, I taught my first course at WashU in 1965, so there are lots of boxes and things to sort through, but it was very easy. It was very, very easy, and I would certainly encourage anybody wondering to go ahead with it. Well, thank you, and thank you for all the organization you did before giving them to us, too. That was a big help. Um, I don't want to stop somebody else from talking, but I do have other types of comments. Uh, one of which is about correspondence, which you didn't get from me. And I wasn't sure that anybody would have interest over it or it was appropriate. Now, if I were writing literature, as you point out, a different sort of paper for novelists or uh, many other fields, I suppose, there would be a lot of interest in my correspondence. And of course, a lot of those, as you well know, got destroyed. Mm -hmm. Dickens burnt his papers. I think Kafka, Kafka destroyed his too. There's a lot of that about. Uh, I don't have a dramatic sex life like Dickens <laughs> did that I need to hide, but uh, it never occurred to me to think, my correspondence, mainly the files I kept with other professors, would be of much uh, interest. I may have some. I may have some of that. But you raised another question when you talked about digital mm -hmm. materials. Obviously, some years ago, what happened was the metal filing cabinets full of manila folders full of correspondence gave way to electrons somewhere. <laughs> um, we talked once about the papers uh, when I was president of an organization and hosted a conference in St. Louis, for example. And I just sort of brushed electronics aside but I think when you talk to faculty these days, that's got to be one of the areas. How do you work out electronic correspondence or all of the materials that go with something like a conference? 
Um, yeah. So we've gotten like three and a quarter or five, you know, three and a quarter inch floppy disks and we're able to pull files off of there. We usually only take them if they're very well identified so that we know because some of the syllabi might be on there or their lectures to the school or other places. Mm -hmm. And then now even it's just they've got Word documents and PDFs on their desktop and we can work to get those. The more organized those are, the better they are for us. You know, the papers, if it's just kind of a jumble, it's easier for us to sort those than those digital files. But we're willing to talk, you know, about the specifics to each individual person and kind of look at that hmm. too. Yeah. Well, it sounds like someday I should take up other time of years and we should talk <laughs> about a couple of things. I've noticed a couple of questions pop by, so I should probably shut up for a while. <laughs> Thanks, Steve, and we'll talk more. <laughs> okay. And we do have a few more questions and one, one person raised their hand, so I'll ask to unmute and she can ask her question. So I have two questions. I have one that's practical. You keep mentioning the linear feet of each collection. So in my mind, I see someone with a ruler and a pencil and a sheet <laughs> of paper, graph paper for every room to figure out how wide and how tall. So I wanted to ask you about how you use the linear feet or if that was just to kind of wow us about how much material. And the, now, second, the second question was about genealogy. I was surprised to see genealogy <gasps> pop up. So how how is that? How do you, do people access that or what are they asking you, I guess? Right. So the linear fee, and I meant to have a box. It's if you could kind of think of it almost as a copy paper box size worth. And those are the files that, you know, the boxes we store them in. And once they go on the shelf, that helps us know how much shelving space we have. But when you're looking at a regular file cabinet, that can be like two to three linear feet. So I'm when I go into a faculty's office and they're like, you can have all of these filing cabinets, <laughs> then that kind of helps me know how many boxes to bring and, and pack them up and, and where we'll store them in the shelves. And then genealogy, that is more with our other collections, not necessarily faculty papers, but we have like the student yearbooks, student publications, um, like student life, but they can get into course catalogs. So they're like, I know my father went here in the 1960s and I know he majored in social work and we can pull out the social work course catalog and say these were the classes he got to choose from and I don't have the student record so I don't have his transcript or anything but they can kind of look at who was teaching during that time and what kind of courses were available and they really like the yearbooks they can find the picture of their grandparent or their father in there and sometimes you know if the faculty member had a big impact on them they could go into the faculty files to see if there was any correspondence with their um relative or just to see what classes they were teaching and how that might have impacted their family member. I have some more questions. They just keep coming in from the chat. Uh, do you accept collections from adjunct faculty? I don't know that I have any yet, but I would be willing to talk to the person more specifically and find out, you know, what kind of material they have and how long they've been here. So I definitely wouldn't rule it out and would be happy to talk more about that. Mm -hmm. Great. And um, Peggy asked, uh, Professor Kirkland had a question which came to me, how much control does a person have over what someone quotes from the material? That's a good question too. So faculty member get to decide if they want to keep copyright to their material or if they want to sign it over to the university. So if they retain copyright, researchers can still come in, access their papers and, you know, take notes, kind of use it in fair use. So that really limits the amount of material or amount of words that they can quote. But then if that person wanted to go and write a book and quote, you know, like an entire letter from you or your entire syllabus, then the researcher would have to get that copyright um, permission from the faculty member. So it doesn't hinder the researchers being able to access your collection if you keep the copyright. It just allows you to kind of see what they're gonna do with it and sign off on that or not. And you briefly mentioned the writers. There have been so many at WashU. What do you have from these people in your collection? 
So those actually live in the manuscript unit within special collections and they have uh, quite a number of them and I think maybe we put in the chat a link to where you could find those more specifically yeah. and we might be able to send that um, out again too. Yeah, I'll send that one again. And then to go along with that, um, do you have any collections from visual artists from LASHU? So we have some, and now I'm not sure if they were faculty or students here, but the Modern Graphic History Library is another collecting area within special collections. And so we've, um, they take care of those collections and feel free to reach out to me and I can get you more specifics about that if you, if you want. Perfect. And somebody asked, um, do you have papers from Arthur Holly Compton? Yes, so we have a ton of papers from him. We have his chancellor collection, but then we have his personal papers and it that's the one that I mentioned and it was 126 linear feet. So it is a lot of material and he willed that to the university um, before he passed. And so there's diaries, there's correspondence, there's some of his teaching material, his research material. So it's a very large collection. And is he one of the largest ones you have? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It seems very. Yes. <laughs> and that inventory is also up online and it is probably down mostly to the folder level description. Okay. Great. And it looks like we have someone raising their hand. Judith Malman is raising her hand. Um, if she wants to unmute, she can ask the question. Let's see if I can. I think she's. Can you hear her? I can't hear her, but she looks like she should be unmuted. Hi, Judith. <laughs> yeah. We can't hear you for some reason. I don't know why. You want to type it in the chat, maybe? Maybe she'll type it in the chat. OK. Um, while we wait, we still have a few more. Uh, does she want to try to type it? Okay. We could put my email in the chat um, cool. and you could email me or I can add my phone number too. Um, let me figure out how to do that exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I'll do that here. And I did too want to see Gar Allen's on here too and just see because he was packing up this summer and we got over 60 boxes this summer with him and so kind of what made him want to give to the archive and how that experience was if Gar is available. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi okay. Gar. Good. I thought you. Yeah. Uh, thanks for doing this. It, uh, well, it certainly was a great pleasure to help do it. We unfortunately uh, the timing wasn't great because uh, the two things that coincided was the, the pandemic and also the fact that the department needed to get uh, some renovation done in the space my old office was in. So they uh, moved me. And I had the great help of Aaron Garrity, who I see on there, who was uh, absolutely superb. But then the, uh, uh, because most people were not working on campus from the archives and so on, uh, we had to sort of store it and then people would come and pick it up in uh, sort of segments. So it was uh, it was a, a very fairly hasty thing, but it was good to get it all done at once. And so the uh, and, and I was flattered too, as the, uh, as the first uh, speaker said that, that that my papers and stuff were going to be served because I think uh, when we all spend a number of years in doing all this work and research and teaching and so on, and then you retire and you think about well you know all this is just going to go into the trash uh that it, it's a little demoralizing but uh, the fact that it seemed valuable was i think really uh helpful uh, to to do that and you all were great in, in in helping to identify the things you wanted in fact you took more types of material that i ever expected you would want including slides from uh, teaching material and all of that and photographs so it was uh, it, it was very helpful to know that that was going to be preserved. I do think it's one of one important things that came up when you were talking about the Hop, Arthur Holly Compton papers. And so that was really the only person that was a, a laboratory scientist 
uh, whose papers, but Wash U does have more than that. Uh, and the medical school does too, of course, but the uh, people that were on their mm -hmm. faculty. But uh, uh, we have the Victor Homburger papers, who was the biology department chairman for uh, almost 25 years. And that was uh, uh, material that uh, the, the original is that he wanted that to go to the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, which is a place he taught that was head of their embryology course. Uh, and that's a place where a number of other papers of embryologists are located. So they said, before we set them off, uh, we had the mo all the most important ones uh, duplicated. So we have them now in the WashU collection uh, as well. And that uh, uh, really makes it important for the institutional uh, history part. And I would, I just, so I just wanna to emphasize to all my colleagues in the sciences to, uh, uh, to consider seriously saving your paper, Sally Elgin, you also mentioned, uh, and she uh, was able to do that. And it's extremely important because I think most people don't think scientists either have much correspondence or if they do, it's not really important. And many scientists don't think it's really that important. Uh, their work is on the lab bench. It's what you do now. It's what you publish in a paper. They don't think much about history. But uh, as a historian of science, I have to tell you, uh, it is a wonderful treat when you do find some scientist has preserved a good percentage of their collections. And it's very frustrating when you find some that have not and that you want to uh, really find out more about. Uh, so I, I worked on a, a geneticist in the early part of the century named Thomas Hunt Morgan, and he every five years he routinely threw away his correspondence and all of his personal papers and lab notebooks and that sort of thing, which was uh, really unfortunate. Uh, but you know, it was able to piece it together by going to the archives of many of the people he corresponded with. So it's just a great resource if it could be all kept uh, in one place. One question I would like to pose, and that is, uh, how do you handle? the professional correspondence uh, that someone wants to contribute uh, and or their personal correspondence uh, during that's the same period, their lifetime, for example. Uh, in some cases, the archives I've worked in, uh, both were there. In some cases, it was only the personal correspondence. And for scientists, very rarely was their personal correspondence there by itself. So how do you uh, pursue that? And, and what's your policy and thoughts on it? So we take both personal and professional correspondence. It again is up to the faculty member that we're talking with and what they've kept and what they want to make available. And what's interesting is the authors of the letters retain copyright. So again, we can make those available for researchers, but it would be their responsibility to clear copyright before using that beyond fair use. But if people want to give us that material, um, we we usually take it depending on, you know, some specifics, but yes, it's, we like to take that. It helps people see more of the faculty member's life, you know, who were they corresponding with professionally, but then learning more about them on their personal side too. So it's not just their teaching material that we're interested in, but, you know, more of the whole person and letting researchers find out more that way too. Right. Okay, good. Thanks, Gar. And I see Jack Kirkland unmuted. Did you want to say something, oh, Jack? Well, I'd like to say what a great job you do. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you come to the office and, and you really do help uh, uh, those who are uh, having materials to uh, donate. Um, I mean, you just help us gather and, and think of things that I never thought about. But, you know, uh, one of the questions I have is, is how, how widely or how would students at the university know about the archives? And what about the, the libraries in the community at large? How, how do they know about it? So there's a few different ways. Like I said, we have the inventories up online. So if you do a search on the library page or even a Google search, often our inventories online come up. And then if the students are searching the regular uh, online catalog that pulls up the books or journals, our 
inventories are also listed in there. So they would see that and then that links out to the inventory pages. And then as we work with faculty members, they bring classes in sometimes. And so we, you know, talk specifically about their topic, but we also put a plug in for the rest of the material that we have. So if they need to archival material for another class that they think about coming into us, we do blog posts that get sent out throughout the university. Sometimes the record newspaper or the Washington Magazine will highlight some of our collections that way. And so that gets us out not only to the students and faculty, but to the wider university and uh, larger communities too. Very good. Good. I think it's, you know, uh, I have a, a grandson that's in school and, and uh, I kind of like the thought that he would be looking up something that I had written. Uh, <laughs> and I could, I could probably uh, convince him better after he's seen it was written and came from the library <laughs> than my sitting there telling him. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is this is this is wonderful. I'm, I'm very happy uh, that you have had the opportunity to be with us for this period of time. Uh, is it, would this link be available for students to um, see and and? Um, Yes, so we've recorded this and within a few days we'll have it up um, on the website and we'll send a, a link to all the participants and then we'll be able to share that out directly with other people who weren't able to make it today. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Peggy, do you have a question? Uh, well, first of all, a comment. I didn't realize I was going to be in such esteemed company today. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Kirkland was one of my professors when I was in school at Bra Bra uh, GWB from 82 to 84. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> and um, I was wondering, because the, the university has had several Nobel laureates. Oh, yes. And I wondered if uh, you were able to, to get some uh, collections from them. We have some of theirs, and right now all of those names seem to escape me, um, but we do have some. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get all of them. Some of the people, you know, would gave to other institutions or might not have given at all, but we do have some of those. And if, if you want a list, just reach out and I will um, track down which ones we do have. I'm sorry, I don't have those names right now, but yes, we do have some of them. Unfortunately, the names are escaping me at the moment also. <laughs> and I think the med school, so um, Carl and Gertie Corey that were scientists um, won a Nobel together and they have some of that material and the actual medal and their certificate that they received. So I do know that one for sure. Gar, did you have another? Well, I could uh, coattail on that. Uh, well, Rita Levy Montalcini was mm -hmm. a member of the biology department for uh, almost 30 years, and she did win a Nobel Prize with uh, uh, Stanley Cohen, who was from the medical school, went on later to Vanderbilt. But they worked as a pair under Victor and with Victor Homburger's uh, help. So that brings me to the question of the departmental uh, archives. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I've noticed in, in both my own research, uh, for example, on Morgan in his 24 years at Columbia University, they didn't say anything really of departmental significance. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed that that's also been true more or less in our biology department at WashU. Now, luckily, partly, I guess, because I was the only historian in the biology department, and also because everybody knew I was a pack rat, that whenever <laughs> anything was found uh, by Andrew Johnston or other people who were clearing out files in basement uh, rooms uh, that looked like it belonged to the department, they would say, do you, do you think we should keep this? Of course, I said yes. Uh, so we ended up in a kind of a helter-skelter way of saving a, a, a some of that, but I'm sure it was only a portion of what ever probably existed. And do you have a policy or a practice of trying to encourage departments uh, in whatever way administrative that could be done to uh, save their material? Because departments function as separate entities within the university, and sometimes their histories are extremely important in the advancing of a field, in changing curriculum, all these sort of interesting questions. Yes, yeah, so we try to um, preserve those materials. It's interesting since we're a private institution, 
nobody really has to give the archives anything. There's not the records retention like the state schools that are, you know, it's government documents and they need to be retained. So, but the departments have given things over the years. Some of that ends up being restricted for a certain amount of time. And so we, we have some, it's not necessarily a full picture and not a full picture for all departments, but it's something that we continue to reach out and try to add to our collections for the departmental records. Good. And Steve, just a second, um, Joe, I'll be right with you too. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. I just wanted to point out in answer to the Nobel question that that huge collection you've talked about a couple of times, Arthur Holly Compton, Compton is of course a Nobel Prize winning physicist. Yes, thank you so much. And hi, Joe, did you have a question or comment? You'll have to unmute. I wonder if we can unmute. Just ask to unmute. I don't know if he has to click something. Tell him to go to the lower left corner of his screen. Maybe that'll help. There you go. The word of praise to Sonia and encouragement to possible donors. I have to confess that I am supremely disorganized. <laughs> And for years, Sonia has been not only supplying boxes, but coming to our uh, uh, home, sometimes to the office, to schlep them out since I don't have a very good back. So this uh, should encourage people like me who don't alphabetize, who don't keep their books in order, but who have many of them. I've enjoyed this thoroughly. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Yes, and your material doesn't have to be fully organized before it comes here. That's part of what we can help with once it gets here. Thank you, Joe. Believe me, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and we have time for one last question here. I received one in the chat. Um, is there a point where you, once you have digitized, you dispose of the papers, or would that be only once you reach capacity? So typically we don't get rid of originals even if we digitize them and fortunately we have some room to expand. So we like to keep the originals. The digital are great as like a backup copy and to be able to make them more widely accessible, but I still really like paper and being yeah. able to go to those. So we do right now keep the originals too. I agree. I like seeing the actual paper and not just sit on the computer. Um, well, thank you everyone for um, coming today. I think we're nearing the end. Um, and thank you, Sonia. This was a very awesome presentation. I've learned so much and I'm sure everyone else has too. Um, and thank you everyone for the great discussion and participation at the end. Um, special thanks to all of you who help uh, sustain the libraries and the university archives with your own contributions. We all really appreciate your support for today. Thank you very much. This was a lot of fun. Well, thank you all. Always good to see you, Jack. Good to see you, Peggy. <laughs> very good. Thank you. thank you very much.